Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, please have it open at 1 Corinthians 15. Now, we're actually going to look at, uh, we're going to start at verse 1, actually, because I think it's important uh, for those opening verses for the sake of understanding what follows the bit that we've just had read to us. Now, before we actually look at the passage, I wonder how many of you are familiar with the Yodok concentration camp located in North Korea. It's also known as Penal Labor Colony Number 15. Um, Bath is 28 kilometers square. The Yodok concentration camp is 372 square kilometers. It is divided into two zones. There's a revolutionary zone where people who are there have the opportunity to get out once they've completed a program of hard labor and education classes to make them more loyal to the state. The other area is known as the permanent control area from which there is no release. Those in the permanent control zone perform hard labor, which includes farming, mining, and logging. It is estimated that 20% of the inmates die annually from malnutrition, but are replaced by other people who enter the camp. Rumors that it closed last year sadly proved to be unfounded. The permanent control area from which there is no release comprises approximately 30 thousand inmates, 6,000 of which are there because they're Christians. It includes men, women, and children. Parents who are imprisoned for their faith are imprisoned with their children too as a deterrent for others to follow. The children do hard labor like their parents. Right now, that is going on in North Korea. There are 6,000 of our brethren in that camp. And my question for you this evening is are they mugs? Did they make a terribly foolish decision when they professed Christ in North Korea? Would it not have been smarter not to do such a thing and risk their own, their wives, their children's lives? Are they idiots for following Jesus? Now, we might not want to say that, but what does our theology say and how we live our lives? You see, if Christianity is only a means to secure certain blessings, community, the pleasure of discussing the Bible, the pleasure of being able to meet like this, the pleasure of being able to worship in him and prayer together, or, or maybe it's something outside this room. It's a means of getting the life you want, a secure environment for your family, a way of ensuring that the person that you marry is going to be stand-up and loyal to you. It's a way of kind of thinking that when you pray for, for blessings as you go forward in life, there'll be someone walking ahead of you, and your job and everything will go fine, and you've got someone to pray for if your kids are in trouble ever, and all of those things. Now, whatever it might be, what would that say to the people in Yodok right now? If that's the value of faith... Where is it right now in North Korea? And if God swapped you, when you walked through that door, he swapped you with someone from that camp, what would happen to your faith? Would all the blessings that you crave, all the blessings that you build your life on, would they be gone? Would you despair because you had been robbed of why you followed Christ? Would your foundation fail because... Let's be honest, if Christianity does not work in that concentration camp, it does not work at all. It is purely something we've constructed because it suits our lives right now. And culturally, it's kind of, it's okay, we can get away with meeting tonight. We're not underneath really that. And it provides us with some kind of psychological comfort. But the reality is that it's false because in hard situations, it no longer works. Now, Paul here is speaking to a church who were in danger of going soft on the resurrection. Now, it doesn't appear they denied there was an afterlife, but they had got this strange idea that the resurrection was more of a spiritual affair. There wasn't any kind of new earth. You weren't raised in your body, and that meant that you could enjoy all the blessings of the resurrection now. So, in fact, life should be a big uphill, sorry, you know, downhill thing. It should be great. You should be happy all the day. All the blessings for now. Now, I've never met anyone, I have to say. No one has ever said to me that they believe that the resurrection has already happened, it's only spiritual. That doesn't seem to be one of the heresies that's burdening the church right now. But are our lives professing that the resurrection 
is impacting them as it should, if it's for real. See, there are four things tonight to put the resurrection where it belongs in our lives and in this CU's life. And the first is that we need to stand firm on the resurrection. If you've got your Bible open, this is from the opening verses of the chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. See, these opening verses of the chapter tee us up for how important everything else will be that follows. See, the gospel is where we begin, isn't it? That's what Paul said. It's the gospel that the Corinthians received. It's where they are currently, on which you have taken your stand. But most importantly, it is where they need to stay. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly. There's no wandering off from the gospel. There's no fresh perspective. There's no new insight on this. The gospel is fixed and firm, and all of us need to stand on it and refuse to be moved. There could be no departing from the non-negotiables that Paul is about to outline and still regarding yourself to hold to the Christian faith. Number one, he says, Jesus died. Now, To state the obvious, for Jesus to die, he had to be real. Now, Christianity isn't a set of ideas. It's not not the case. It doesn't really matter if Jesus existed or not, because what it's really about is the ideas. It's not a philosophy. It's not a way of being. And Jesus' death was not the tragic death of a promising young philosopher. It's not like an early death where we should look at it and wonder what he might have achieved if only the Romans hadn't got him. It's at the centre of what he came to do. It's why on the cross, his final words were, it is done, or tetelestai, finished. Not because he was finished, but because his work was completed. Now, his teaching wasn't at the heart, the very heart of what he came to do. This is Jesus' words. For even the Son of Man, that's himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that brings us to the next negotiable non-negotiable he died for our sins he died in the atonement as we call it he died to pay the price the penalty to stand in your place to absorb the wrath that you deserved each of us should declare in my place condemned he stood he went to the cross to bear a weight that you and i could not now the cross is not some generic act of love we're very clear, actually, in, in, in that hymn we just sung. The cross is not just Jesus showing that he loved us in some kind of general, non-specific way. Some people try and say that. They try and get the idea of wrath out of the cross. That simply will not do, and it makes no sense. And I will now show you for why. Um, hello. We've not met. Chelsea. Chelsea, okay. Don't, don't worry. This isn't, the, honestly, this isn't dangerous, and it's not as dangerous as it might appear. But um, <clears throat> Now, just imagine, Chelsea, that I was, in this moment, to confess my undying love for you, which would, <laughs> would be a shock for everyone, and particularly my wife. Um, <laughs> but let's just say that I was to do that, and I was to say, you know, I absolutely adore you, and I really want to show you how much I love you. I, I, and in doing that, I was to go into my bag and produce this. <laughs> At which point I say, look, I really do love you, and the way I'm going to do it is, is like this. And I stab myself like this and collapse in a heap. Now, after, after the exec had, <laughs> after the exec had cleared up the mess afterwards and you were back to having your coffee and everything afterwards, would the girls here be saying to one another, did you see that? It was so romantic. <laughs> Went right through his heart and all, and the guys are going, well, he was smooth. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> No, 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 the conversation by the lines of who was that lunatic and what was he doing? Because it wouldn't prove that I loved anyone, would it? It would be crazy. And, and the fact that Jesus died, if it achieves nothing and was for no purpose, would prove he was to be pitied, not worshipped. The cross cannot be emptied of the wrath of God. Jesus stood in your place and mine condemned in order that we could be set free. We are free indeed because of Christ. Third, that death was in accordance with the scriptures. Don't let that slip under your radar. If you look down in uh, verses 3 and 4, Paul says it twice. The death of Christ was in accordance with the scriptures. Now he's making that point, say one, it was planned. It was not some terrible accident. Two, he's saying it that it was in accordance with the scriptures because the Old Testament 
prophesied the death of Christ. But crucially as well, it's because the Old Testament speaks of Christ throughout. Okay? So from the time that, that, that mm. Adam and Eve first fell, God clothed them. What does he clothe them with? Animal skins. Because animal skins, you need sacrifice to cover sin. You see it again at the Passover that the lambs die in the place of the firstborn sons and Israel walks free. You see it in the sacrificial system and you see it in the temple. All of those things are there to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus, so that we would be confident that this is God's plan. It's foreseen that he would conquer death. Jesus said as much. On the road to Emmaus, after he's risen, after the resurrection we're speaking of, he says to his disciples, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Bible is a book about Jesus. It's a book about Jesus. And he should walk off the pages of the Old Testament when you read it. And if the Old Testament is a mystery to you as a Christian, you need to speak to your pastor about that and help you sort it out. The Old Testament is all about Jesus, God preparing the way for the Messiah. Christ died in accordance with the Scriptures, and that should also affirm the authority of Scripture. It's of first importance. Paul doesn't just say, he rose again because I know it, I was there, I saw it, which he does say. But the Scriptures are absolutely crucial. The Lord Jesus came to restore. And fourth, he was raised on the third day. Now, um, I did. I had a great illustration here um, that I was going to use, but it required me to pass some roadkill on my drive up here, and it didn't. So uh, we're not going to use that one, which would have been exciting, but there we go. So instead, I need, uh, I need a volunteer. Sam, thank you. <coughs> up you come. Nowhere else you'd rather be tonight? <laughs> I thought you might have done, yeah. <laughs> um, Now, what, what I'm going to do, just all, all you have to do is stand there and not look awkward because there's a lot of people looking at you. Okay, what, how should I look? Well, you can look awkward if you like. There are a lot of people looking at you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do now is I'm going to levitate, Sam, up to the ceiling and back. I'm going to do it from here. Yeah, you can stand like that, it's fine. Now, I want you to watch as I levitate him floor to ceiling, okay? Are you watching? You don't want to miss this. It's spectacular. Watch. <laughs> Thank you. You can sit down now. Now, who was impressed by my act of levitation there? Yeah, excellent. One guy. <laughs> now, I think that's probably because you were expecting some kind of literal levitation, weren't you? That's what you were expecting, that he would actually move. But what I performed there was a spiritual act of levitation. You have to have the eyes of faith to see what I was doing there. No, 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 that's not what happened with Jesus, okay? That's the emperor's new clothes, and it's nonsense. He was not symbolically raised. He was not metaphorically raised. He was actually raised. He came back in bodily form. Absolutely crucial. You read the Gospels, what did he do next? He went for a barbecue on the beach and ate fish with his mates. What any sensible man would do, having come back from the dead. You don't eat if you're metaphorically raised. Okay? The resurrection is symbolic of nothing other than the total victory of Jesus Christ over sin and death and hell and Satan. It is a literal resurrection. It's why Paul cites all these witnesses. If you look in these verses, you don't have to go through them all. Peter, sorry, he identifies this huge group of people, including himself, who all saw the risen Christ because it actually happened. The resurrection is proof of who Jesus is, that he dealt with our sin and that he conquered death. And we'll come back to that in a minute. There is no room for flexibility on any of these things. Anyone who tells you otherwise needs to be ignored and corrected. There is no other way of interpreting these truths. There is no other way of looking at them. These are not secondary. It is not okay if a church decides to think differently about them. It has ceased to be a church of Christ. These things are of first importance. We must stand firm on the resurrection. Secondly, we live for the resurrection. It's the first bit we had out. Paul, Paul now sets out the consequences if the resurrection isn't true. And this isn't just a tick on your orthodoxy list. Look at verse 12. But if Christ... It, but if if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there is no resurrection of the, resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, again, he's speaking to these folk in Corinth who've lost sight, who, who've lost a belief in a physical resurrection. And he's saying, well, if, 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 if there is no physical resurrection, then Jesus didn't rise either. You can't exclude him. And then you're back to the emperor's new clothes. If Jesus didn't really rise, then, then, then his body is still in the grave and there is no victory. And he spells out a number of implications. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, verse 13, Christianity is a total waste of time. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He's not messing about here, is he, Paul? There's no, uh, well, it's a nice thing to believe, it's a good thing to do on Sundays. He's saying if there is no resurrection, then there is no resurrection power. There's no gospel, and it's all a waste of time. And if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then in verse 15, then they're all liars. More than that, we have found them to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. In which case, why listen to anything the Bible says, given the central thing it's about is the resurrection and the gospel of Jesus? And one of my daughters, and you've probably met people like this. I had them at school. My daughter has one of these people in, in her class who just makes up completely tall stories. And because my daughter's quite young, she just brings them home as if they're true. So I hear Katie used to live in Disneyland. Katie's going to be in the next Olympics, etc. Et totally unreliable, this girl. I don't know what she's... But I wouldn't believe anything that Katie said, to be honest. Full of tall stories she is. We've all met people like that. And if a resurrection didn't happen, then the Bible's just a book of tall stories. And why believe anything it says? It's just been made up by someone. No, it, 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 the Bible claims to speak into our lives, to, be able to change our eternities. And, and, and if that isn't true, we shouldn't listen to anything it says. And if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then verse 17, we're still separated from God. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. There isn't any triumph. Jesus is just some carpenter who said some pretty cool things and then died. And our biggest problem remains that we are separated from our creator God by the wrong that we've done. Jesus hasn't sorted our sin problem. And if he's not been raised from the dead, then verse 18, when you're dead, you are dead. And that is it. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. There is no hope. There's this life, and then that's it. The best you can hope for is that it goes okay for you and yours. And you get through life, and you get a long life, not too much sickness, not too much uh, difficulty, and you make your way through. Because when it's over, it's over. And when you die and the memory of you dies after you, you're eternally lost. Now, we might respond to all this by saying, I don't actually need any convincing about that because I believe in the resurrection. I believe that Jesus rose. I believe that one day he'll raise me. Um, it's not a problem. Look at verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are above all people most to be pitied. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christians me included, are pathetic. That's what Paul's saying. It's penetrating stuff. There's none of this, it doesn't really matter if you want to be a Christian or it doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. But, but do our lives testify to that? Do they testify to the fact that the resurrection is the most important thing in all of history and the most important thing that defines your life? Like Paul, would your life deserve nothing but pity if it turned out this was all made up? Now, back when I was young, there was quite a famous Christian, and he said that it wouldn't matter to him if someone proved that Christianity was wrong, because he said he had a good life, he'd seen the world, and he'd got a great family. Now, I don't think that's the kind of discipleship that Jesus is talking about. One where we hedge our bets and say, well, I, I, if it did turn out it wasn't true, I don't want anyone laughing at me, so I'd better make sure that I have one hand on God and one hand in the world, and either way, then, I can't lose. I don't think that's the kind of radical discipleship that Jesus calls us to, where we only follow him in the hope that he'll fix our health, get us the job we want, find us a partner. That's just what I call wrong seal Christianity, where we try and paint Jesus on to protect us from the difficulties of life, but we don't actually live for him. Our life should make no sense if this isn't true. The things we've given ourselves to, the principles you followed, the time you spent in prayer, the things you've given your money and your service time to, your life should look ridiculous if it turns out that this isn't true. Are you banking everything on Jesus? Have you gone all in on him, shirt off your back and all? That's what we're called to, based on the fact that he died 
and rose again. Because that's exactly what those guys in North Korea have done. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then they are idiots. None of this is true. If none of this is true, then they're suffering for no reason at all. It's pointless. They're to be pitied for the stupidity of their decision. Now, what does our life say? What does your life, what does mine say about the reality of the resurrection? Thirdly, we're to look forward to the resurrection, verses 20 to 28. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Paul isn't equivocating here. He's having none of it. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There is no debate. There's no two ways of looking at this. People who say there is no resurrection are just plain wrong. Jesus rose. He is the first fruit, which means that in a harvest, it's an Old Testament image, in a harvest, you get the stuff that appears first. That's the first fruits, and they were offered back to God as a thanksgiving offering, which is why, they, they're, sorry, they're a promise of what is to come. And that's why Christ is the, the first fruits of the people that have fallen asleep. It doesn't mean that, that, that that's not Paul teaching that when we die, we kind of remain unconscious until the Lord returns. Um, it, when he spoke to the thief on the cross, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. The reason is that, uh, is that uh, death, our body, is separated from our soul. Our soul goes to be with the Lord and our body awaits resurrection at his return. That's why it's called sleeping. You may know that Christians invented the word cemetery, which comes from the Latin word for dormitory, because people looked at a graveyard and didn't see death. They saw bodies sleeping and waiting in resurrection hope for the return of the Lord. I'm a pastor. I've buried a number of my folk up at Haycombe on the edge of Bath. And when I go there again for another funeral, I catch sight of graves where I put people in them. And for those that love the Lord, I can't help but smile, because I know, I know that one day they will rise now that lies in the future that lies in the future the bible does not teach that this world will just tick on forever and ever and ever with ever more people going up to heaven in an endless cycle no we look for the final triumph of christ and and that's what paul in these few verses here summarizes for us he's showing us that that that, that the resurrection is at the heart of everything we believe first uh, uh, the past look at verse 21 please We've got the whole of history there. He says, for since death came through a man, death was something that came, not something that always was. Death is only natural in a world that is already broken. God did not make the world this way. What kind of God would have made a world this way? Either a psychopathic God who who, who just dreamed up everything that's wrong with the world or a God who wasn't powerful enough to make a better world. The Bible teaches otherwise. It's what it says here, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. When Adam sinned, he brought a devastating spiritual consequence to the world. For as in Adam all die, death came to us, we were separated from our creator God, and we all follow Adam in his sin. So in Christ all will be made alive. There is hope through Christ because he died and rose again he has conquered death and that brings us to the present but each in turn christ the first roots then when he comes those who belong to him those who belong to him the bible doesn't teach that the resurrection applies indiscriminately it's people that belong to jesus who will rise we need to have faith in christ we need to belong to him through the gospel it's why we preach the gospel it's why you as a CU exist to give everyone on this campus the opportunity to hear the gospel and put their faith in the Lord Jesus. We're in that gospel age now, that part of the verse is where we stand this evening. But then Paul moves on to the future, the then. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to the God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy destroyed is death. Now, I know Christians differ in some of the details of the end times, but we mustn't miss the wood for the trees here. It's very clear what he's saying. Every dominion, authority, and power will not be finally defeated until the Lord returns, which means in this life and in this world there will be suffering for all of us, and particularly for some. At times there will be persecution. It's knowing that fact and knowing that that doesn't mean that God's abandoned them, that is keeping our brothers and sisters going in North 
career. And understanding that will keep you on track if things get tricky here. You see, the way the wind is blowing, in your generation, you will face persecution if you hold fast to the truths of the gospel. If you hold fast to the exclusive claim that there is no other way to be saved than through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. If you hold firm to the teaching of the Bible, biblical standards, the truth of God's word, the fact we are required to follow him. The question for all of us, and you can't even answer this as a CU, you have to answer it individually, is will you cave? Will you love comfort? Will you love respect? Will you love the approval of this world more than you love Jesus? There's not a person in this room who won't be asked that question during their lifetime. And the question is, how will you respond? Not how the guy next to you or the girl behind you, but how will you respond? Because if you do cave, it's going to look like a monumental mistake when he returns. And when he returns, death will finally die. We'll be back where we started in a world without end, without pain, without suffering, without our greatest enemy, death. There will be many wonderful physical things in heaven. The Bible's clear. There is a new heaven and a new earth. Fine food, good wine, amazing sunsets, beautiful forests, awesome mountains, a lot. But there are no gra- there's no death, there's no graveyards. There's just the Lord in all his triumph. And now some of you here probably have confronted death. Many of you haven't. Again, partly because of my work, but partly because my first wife died of cancer. I have been with people at the moment that they breathed their last. I have seen death as close as it gets. I've lost the most important person I had in this world at one time. And I've seen the difference it makes knowing that that is not the end. Death is the biggest problem we face. No one has any answers for it outside of Jesus. Our time is against us. We're not going to look at verses 27 and 28 in any detail. But please don't note this. Paul, five times in two verses, he says, uses the word everything or all. And four times he uses the words to put under or make subject to. The point he is making is the day is coming when Jesus will be completely unopposed, when all things will be made subject to him, and he will hand the kingdom over to God the Father. Now, we don't need to be troubled when Paul says that Jesus will be subject to God the Father. That doesn't imply that Jesus isn't really God. It doesn't imply that he's lesser or or less complete. Submission biblically means a difference in role, but not in status. So when Jesus submits the will of the Father, it doesn't mean that he's inferior to the Father. It just means that within the Trinity, he has a different role. Now, the question for all of us is, what difference does this future make? If this is how history stretches out from the time of Adam, when things were perfect and we fell, and it stretches forward to when Christ comes and defeats every power and dominion and the dead are raised, how does that affect the way you live today? Or are you just drifting? Is it the kind of thing you expect to make a difference when you're really old, just like me, and you start worrying about dying? Is is that what all this is for? Because actually life just goes on as it would do anyway until you get in trouble. And then that's what these thoughts are for. When we're worried about death, that's when we start thinking about heaven. But apart from that, it's got nothing to do with real life. Does it affect the decisions we make? Would all the decisions you make be the same, whether or not this was true? Would your life look exactly the same if your Christianity was stripped from it? Would you be making the same decisions? How has it influenced the way you look ahead? All of you are going to be making decisions about where you live, what you do, who you marry, all of those things. How has this future mapped out for us that God has revealed to us, changing the way you live? One day, all of this, the chair you're sat on, the floor I'm walking on, the ceiling above us, it will all be gone replaced with something new and better and perfect. Which world are you living for? And finally, and very briefly, we need to listen to the resurrection. Now, now we, we, there's no doubt here, you may have noticed it when you read, we get to one of the most confusing verses in the New Testament. Paul gives two examples of things that are utterly pointless if the resurrection is a myth. Now, the second thing he says is easy enough, because he basically says, what's the point of suffering 
for the resurrection if there is no resurrection, but it never really happened. What was the point of fighting with Beast in Ephesus? It's probably there that he's characterizing the opponents he had when he was in Ephesus rather than the, the, the idea that he was a gladiator. But he's saying, is, what's the point of going through all that if none of it's true? Why, why would I bother? Why would anyone bother to put themselves through that if it's just a myth? If I didn't really believe that I'd met with the risen Jesus, why would I be doing that? Now, now that one's easy enough to see. But when he says this, now if there is no resurrection, what do those who are baptized, what what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized? And that has to be one of the most confusing verses in all the scriptures. And I can tell you tonight, I've looked at what a lot of people said about that. And frankly, no one's quite clear what it means. However, the leading theory, I'd say, is the one proposed by John Calvin, which is that people think that what was happening here is there were people within the community who had died before they had the opportunity to be baptized. Uh, you know, maybe older folk, people who were ill, were converted, didn't have the opportunity to get baptized, and in solidarity with them, people that cared about them would be baptized. Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian, thought that it should be correctly translated, have been baptized because of the dead, not for the dead. So what, what it's saying here is people have been inspired by seeing martyrs to follow Jesus and be baptized themselves. And then that would fit with what Paul says afterwards, that the that, that, if, if there is no resurrection, then why would that, why would that lead other people towards faith? What, whatever the Corinthians were up to, it can't have meant that they thought by being baptized for people that it saved them or made them Christians. It cannot have meant that because if it did, Paul would have confronted it in the letter and said that's not the gospel. If someone's dead, you can't be baptized on their behalf to help them. So whatever it meant and whatever the reason, it can't have challenged the gospel. But what Paul's saying is, why do you do that if there is no resurrection? Now, we may choose to try and live for the resurrection, but there's loads of voices trying to distract you. There's loads of voices trying to distract you for living outside of this world. That's why it says in verse 32, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's a phrase of the Epicureans. And when they said that, they didn't just mean go out and get absolutely hammered and eat massive kebabs. What it meant was... Just enjoy the fine things in life. That's what they meant by it. Enjoy going out for dinner. Enjoy fine wine. In their day, enjoy going to the theatre. So for us, it might be just enjoy the finer things in life. Enjoy going to, to, going to, going to the cinema. Or enjoy sports. Enjoy holidays. Enjoy houses. Enjoy cars. You know, this life is all there is. So you've got to grab what you can. So, so just enjoy it. Just make the most of the fact that you got a chance to go round the ride once before you died. That's what the Epicureans said. That's all there is to life. Just enjoy it. And we can be deceived by those things. And Paul is saying, don't be, don't listen to those siren voices that would wreck your faith. Don't be afraid to suffer for the gospel or make decisions that your contemporaries and your friends or even your family will go, why on earth would you do that? You know, you've got a great degree, you've got a golden ticket. Why on earth would you do that with it? You know, it's, it's, it's all right you being a Christian, I don't mind, but now you're being silly. Don't do that. Don't waste your life. But the fact is, they're not fools. They're not fools in that concentration camp this evening. We sang earlier that people who know Christ are free indeed. The reality is that those people in that camp are freer than the people that guard them in the only way that matters. It's a wonderful song that we sung earlier. You are free indeed. Through Christ, free in the only way that matters. As we stand here now, and probably I guess we've got another time of praise coming up, do we? It's going to be about the time those guys being kicked out of bed to start their next day of hard labour. That won't end probably for any of them until the Lord returns or they die. And for some of them, that journey home will happen today. Now remember that when we praise God later, we sing in solidarity. Earlier, people remarked about the freedom we have. They don't have that freedom, yet they are our family and our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are not idiots. But the question for all of us is, will we go on? Take a look around you. I mean, actually do it. The faces, the people. Now, where will the people you just looked at be in 10 years' time? One or two of you may have stepped into eternity. But will the rest of you be going on strong? I wonder how many of you, your love for the Lord will have grown cold as the cares of this world creep in. How many of you, your career will have become more important than meeting with the Lord's people. 
For how many of you will have thought, well, if I can't find a Christian to marry, I'll marry someone else. For how many of you will have wandered off the path, or will all of us be found in 10 years, going on strong for the Lord, filled with love for him and desiring to serve him, filled with resurrection hope and sharing it with the people around us? Will we have grown cold? We have listened to those voices, because Paul says if we do, we end up in a drunken stupor, like the people I'm sure you've seen on campus stumbling around with no idea where they are or what they're up to. And every time you see someone like that, which you will do, remind yourself that that is what it is to be like to forget who Jesus is and what he did. Stumbling around in the dark with no idea who you are or where you're going. Through his spirit, Christ has revealed himself to you. He's given you his word to guide you. He's put fire in your heart for him. Don't let that grow cold. Wherever it may take him, whatever the cost will be, there is literally no chance that it won't be worth it. So as a CU, to be focused on the resurrection is to keep it front and center. Don't ever stop preaching the gospel. There are many, many good things, many enjoyable things, many blessings you could enjoy. But you exist to give people the opportunity to have their eternities changed for the better. Don't ever let that fall off the radar of what you're doing when you gather here. You have a unique opportunity, I can tell you. I'm still in contact with a lot of my non-Christian friends from university. They get harder-hearted year on year as they put down firmer and deeper roots in this world. You have a massive opportunity here. Don't miss it to share the gospel with you. If there are people that you are concerned about tonight, friends and course mates who you fear you have not done all you could to share the gospel with them or who don't know you're a Christian, Bring them before the Lord later and seek his courage and the opportunity to tell them the good news of what you know. And if they don't like what you say, let the chips fall where they may, because in eternity, if they turn to Christ, they will thank you. Whatever, whatever we do, listen to the Lord who died and rose again. Don't be suckered by a world that would knock you off course. If this is all true, which as Paul says it is, it's a fact then this gospel demands your soul, your life, your all. Amen.